Well, good morning, friends. It's great to be here. Really appreciated that singing. That was awesome. Um, yeah, some of you know uh, my mom. She's often seated right down here, Lorna Harris. And I want to thank those of you who've been praying for my mom. Uh, she's been in the hospital, I think it's about two weeks now. Uh, she had some knee replacement surgery, then she got a bad infection. They had to open it up and get rid of the infection and sew her up again. So it's been a lot of trauma on that joint. I think it'd be hard on anybody, but when you're 87, uh, it's really hard. Yeah, so thank you for your prayers. Uh, I was in to see Mom yesterday, spent some time with her, and somehow she knew I was preaching today. So uh, she asked me what I was going to preach about. And uh, I said, Mom, I'm going to preach about the story of Simeon meeting the Christ child. And she told me about how much she loved that story. And uh, then she said, would you mind telling me what you're going to say? So uh, she kind of put me on the spot, didn't she? (laughs) And uh, so I gave her, I think it was about a five-minute summary of of what I was going to say this morning. And she said, Mark, I am sure it's going to bless everyone. I'm sure it's going to bless everyone. Now, I don't know about you, but when my mom says something, I tend to believe her. I believe her. Uh, You know what the Apostle James said, the prayers of a righteous mom availeth much. And so my mom has prayed a blessing over us this morning, and mom said it, and I believe it. So let's be open to how God wants to bless us this morning. We're going to look at a text together. I'm just going to look back here so that I can read the text and make sure I read the same one that you guys see. Let's uh, move to our reading. This is Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 22. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Well, we give thanks to God for his word. December 24th. We all know what that day is, right? December 25th, we don't even have to say what that day is. But what about February 3rd? February 3rd. I've got you there, don't I? You know, there are some churches, our more liturgical sister churches, that actually have services on February 3rd to mark these very events that we have read about in our text in Luke chapter 2, the presentation and the consecration or dedication of the Christ child. 
You see, according to the Old Testament law, eight days after a boy was born, a firstborn boy, he was to be circumcised. And then the family went into a period of purification. Luke talks about that. If a boy was born, that was to be 33 days. So you can see about 40 days after the birth of Jesus, which we celebrate on December 25th, you have these events, February the 3rd. And Luke does give us a sense that this was a special moment in the life of the Holy Family. Joseph and Mary, they bring Jesus into Jerusalem. In keeping with the law, they've brought two pigeons or two turtle doves to sacrifice. They're clearly devout and pious Jews. They want to do things for their son in a God-honoring way. And they want to get the details right. And Luke tells us that while they were there in the temple, they meet this remarkable man, Simeon. And in fact, Luke spends a couple of verses just telling us what kind of man this Simeon was. It's like a character reference, if you will. It's like Luke is saying to us, this is a man that you can trust, especially with anything he has to say about Jesus and with what God is doing through the Christ child. Simeon, we're told, was righteous and devout. He was a faithful, God-fearing man who loved God with his whole heart. Righteous and devout. And Luke tells us two other things about Simeon that we don't want to miss. The first is that Simeon was looking forward to the consolation of Israel. He was looking forward. Notice that the very first verb, the very first action associated with Simeon is looking, looking. More of that later, but let's take note of that. Simeon is looking and longing for the coming of the Messiah who will rescue Israel from their misery and bring them consolation, comfort, salvation. Simeon is an old man who is in touch with his deepest longings. And that is no small thing. He is faithfully watching and waiting for the Messiah. It's clearly the preoccupation of his heart and soul. But there's one more thing that Luke wants us to notice about this remarkable man, Simeon. He mentions it not once, but actually three times in three verses. I wonder if you caught it. Simeon, first of all, is a man in touch with the Holy Spirit. So in touch, we're told that the Holy Spirit actually rested on him. There was some kind of abiding, ongoing connection between the Spirit and Simeon. So in touch with the Spirit, verse 26, that he had heard the Spirit whisper to him, as it were, that before he died, he would actually get to see the Messiah, come. So in touch with the Spirit, verse 27, that it was the Spirit who was providentially guiding Simeon into the temple. You see, on that day, Simeon walks into the temple, and there by chance, no, not by chance, but by the Spirit's leading, Luke makes it clear, he meets Joseph and Mary and the Christ child. And at just that moment, of all the moments in a busy temple, full of the bustle every day, full of pious people doing what God required of them, at just that moment, in just that place, Simeon encounters the Holy Family. This is not happenstance. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Simeon is a man in touch with the Spirit of God. And he needed to be in touch with the Spirit, didn't he? I mean, think about what's unfolding here. He needed to be in touch with the Spirit to actually see what was happening before his eyes. Now, it's possible we might imagine this scene of the blessing and dedication. We might imagine seeing it unfolding with special effects supplied from the religious drama department. You know, descending doves, angelic visitations, singing choirs. But there's none of that 
in this passage. It was, granted, a very religious moment. We're in Jerusalem. We're at the temple. Circumcision, purification, consecration. There are God-fearing people like Joseph and Mary who are there. Simeon's prayer, as we'll see, is full of scriptural allusions. Joseph and Mary bring what they're supposed to bring to the temple. God's promises to his people are being kept. It's a very religious moment. But at the same time, let's not miss the fact, friends, that it's a very ordinary moment. There would have been tons of families bringing their children to the temple. No doubt the temple in its outer precincts, and that's where these events would have happened, was a very busy, bustling place. How did Simeon know this was the moment? How did he know this was the baby, the Messiah? I mean, the least thing the spiritual special effects department could have done was to provide Joseph and Mary with an unspeakably white, unblemished, beautiful lamb. The Old Testament said that when you dedicated your firstborn, you should bring a lamb and a dove, or if you were poor, you could bring two doves. Jesus and uh, Joseph and Mary were from the poor of Israel. There was nothing exceptional at all about their offering to the Lord. They couldn't afford that lamb. I mean, the scene was so ordinary, so nondescript. The day looked no more special. It looked as normal as this day looks to you and me as we've gathered and kind of come to our own temple. But that's the scene viewed through human eyes, isn't it? That's the scene viewed through human eyes. In fact, something spiritually deep and rich and momentous is unfolding in these events. God is coming to rescue Israel and rescue the whole world, Gentiles included, and Simeon, the one who is looking, remember, Simeon gets it, he sees it, doesn't he? Led by the Holy Spirit, he sees it. He gets it. As in so many other places in the gospel stories around the birth of Jesus, and we're going to be immersed in them in these upcoming weeks, the events often unfold in very mundane, ordinary ways. A donkey ride. Rumors spread in a village. A stable. Dirty, marginalized shepherds hanging on the outskirts of a small town. A refugee family flees to Egypt. Normal, inconspicuous things. Evelyn Underhill writes this, one of her quotes that we're going to look at this morning, of the whole Christmas story, really. A tremendous spiritual event then took place, she writes, Something that disclosed the very nature of God and his relationship to the universe. But there was little to show for it on the surface of life. All people saw was a poor girl unconditionally submitted to God's will and a baby born in very difficult circumstances. Take note of this. And this contrast between the outward appearance and the inner reality is true of all of God's comings to us. We must be very loving and very alert to recognize them if we want to recognize them in their earthly disguise. Friends, this old man Simeon was so loving so alert to the ways of the Spirit that he was able to see in the temple that day what crowds of others simply missed. He saw himself and his people for who they really were, those in desperate need of God's salvation. He saw Jesus for who he really was, even in the guise of a six-year-old boy, cooing, kicking, maybe crying. 
Simeon saw God's salvation. He saw God's light, the light of the world, God's glory. There in the form of a little baby boy. It's an incredible moment. Simeon could see it. And so he breaks out in a beautiful prayer, verses 29 to 32. Master or sovereign Lord, he addresses the Lord personally. Now you are dismissing your servant in peace. That may have been a euphemism for the fact, I'm, I'm ready to die, Lord. Now I've seen your Holy One, the Messiah. For mine eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. It's a prayer that's full, again, of seeing and light, isn't it? My eyes have seen your salvation, a light for revelation, for glory, glory being the blinding presence and light, the excellence of God. Simeon may be an old man in this scene. Who knows how well his physical eyes could see at that point in his life, but his spiritual eyes were incredibly keen. He could see what others could not see. They were full of love and alertness. So friends, I wonder about you and me this Advent season. How might we be the people of God with spiritual eyes full of alertness and love waiting to see God come? into our lives. How might we see through the ordinariness, so-called ordinariness of our day-to-day lives, deep into their inner spiritual reality? How can we prepare our hearts? That's what this season is about. How can we cultivate a deep sense of need for our Savior? Surely we don't need any convincing of that in 2022, with all that's happened? How do we cultivate a deep sense of longing for Jesus and for Jesus coming into our world, coming into our lives? Well, it's such a beautiful scene. I think that's partly what just what drew my mom and, and, and drew so, draws so many of us to this, to this scene. It's so humanly moving and poignant. An old man holds Jesus, holds a baby, cradles him and with tenderness and devotion prays over him from his heart. There's something so affecting uh, about that picture. I know Adrian and I have a picture at home that we really treasure. It's just a, a small little thing, but it's a picture of my grandfather, Stuart McPherson. Uh, he's in his late 70s, maybe he's early 80s at that point, and he has an arm around our son Dylan, who was just two at that point, and their faces are together. They're touching. And uh, they're both looking into the camera uh, with contentment, and, and one imagines great love. And I love that picture. My grampy's face, Dylan's great, great grandfather, really warm and generous, and, and yet full of wear and tear, right, as our faces get over the years. Uh, the lines and ruts of old age, and then right beside him, Dylan, at two, his skin so, so fresh and young and beautiful, and they're both looking out. I love that picture. There's something so moving about the elderly and the young together. You sense the contrast, but you also sense the deep connection between the two. I'm sure you've had moments like that or seen scenes like that. Well, I am so thankful that one of our greatest painters actually took the time to paint a scene uh, of of this particular moment. Uh, Rembrandt um, and his scene, uh, Simeon and the Christ Child in the Temple. That has to be my favorite Christmas painting. It's beautiful. And so I'm just going to invite you to look at it Simeon, the old man, his whole face and body bathing in the light, the salvation 
the glory of the Christ child, a warm golden light that illuminates everything. I think that's Mary in the background. And isn't it interesting that Rembrandt paints Simeon with his eyes closed? Now, Simeon was an old man. His eyes may have been failing him, getting weak. We don't really know. But Rembrandt portrays him, in effect, as a blind man, as a man who can't see. But you get his point, don't you? This was one of the very last works of Rembrandt. And I think he knew in his old age that when it comes to seeing Jesus, when it comes to seeing the Christ child, it's not about physical sight. It's about spiritual sight. It's about spiritual insight. About who Jesus really is. Remember, to others it looked like an ordinary event. To Simeon, it was full of light and glory. His physical eyes are shut, but his eyes of the heart, that's an expression from the Apostle Paul, his eyes of the heart are wide, wide open. And so friends, we can see it in this painting, disappeared. Spiritual light comes to those with open hearts and with prayerful hands. I think Rembrandt gets pretty close to the heart of the meaning of this passage and I think the meaning of this passage for you and me. Advent, of course, means coming. We anticipate the coming of the Christ child at Christmas. We also anticipate Christ's second advent when he appears again to make all things right. In Advent, we remember these comings of Jesus, but we also remind ourselves that God is always coming into our lives, isn't he? Day by day, moment by moment, he's coming into our lives in my so-called ordinary life, in your so-called ordinary life. One more quote from Evelyn Underhill. What is the great lesson of Advent? It's the many-sided truth of God's perpetual coming to his creatures in secret and humble ways. The nearness of his saving care and energizing grace. Have you not heard his silent steps? He comes, comes, ever comes. In the season of Advent, at the beginning of the church year, the church looks outward toward eternity and recognizes her own poverty and imperfection and her utter dependence on this perpetual coming of God. Our spiritual life depends on his perpetual coming to us far more than our going to him. We should think of the whole power and splendor of God as always pressing in on our small souls. In him we live and move and have our being. But that power and splendor mostly reach us in homely, we could say ordinary, inconspicuous ways. In the simple sacraments, the blood the wine, the, the bread, the body, in our prayers, our joys and sorrows, in all of our opportunities for loving service, your family life, your work life, that's where God loves to come. Do we have eyes to see his coming? That's the challenge, isn't it, for you and me? Oh, to have eyes like Simeon's, to actually see the coming of the Lord in our lives. I think about a young man I talked to recently who told me that he could see God at work in his relationship with his young kids, something as earthy and as practical as that. He, he recognized that he was enjoying playing with them more, and he was more patient and kind. He recognized God coming into his life in that simple but so important thing. I recently met with a man who told me how surprised he was when he had an opportunity to praise 
and encourage his wife. He said it was as if my tongue was loosed and he was able to offer her meaningful affirmation and praise. He could see God coming into his life in that moment. And notice, friends, that these examples are from family life. Friends, it's so important for us, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, kids, it is so important for us to realize that God can be so powerfully at work in our families. His will is that every family is a holy family where we're alert to his comings, his presence in our family lives, holy in the ordinary, in the routine, in the mundane. A few weekends ago, I was chatting with someone and they wished, they said they wished they could do something in public for God, to be able to preach like you, Mark. Now, friends, I do believe that God can be coming to us through a sermon. My mom believes that too, and I believe it. That's why I'm up here in that faith, that God may come to us in this moment. But I was able to say to my friend that what really brought my heart great joy was when I could sense God in the ordinariness of my days, when I sensed his presence there. I told him about a day I had recently experienced. It was so simple. In the morning, I had really been encouraged in meeting with a good friend. I received his love. Later that morning, I had the chance to help someone clean their house. In the afternoon, I had visited a young man. I spent the evening with my beloved wife, Adrian, feeling her love. You know, I got to the end of the day and I realized what an amazing day this has been. Opportunities to give love and receive love. It was amazing, a real gift. And yet it was so quiet and ordinary. And yet on that day, God gave me eyes to see it for what it really was. Friends, there are a lot of days that that I just miss it. I miss it. God's activity in the ordinary ebb and flow of life. And so I pray for eyes like old Simeon, looking, always looking, for the signs of Jesus' coming into our lives, seeing, receiving, absorbing, even basking in the light of the Christ child and then offering God's praise. May it be so. Amen? Amen. Have you been blessed? Thank you, Mom. (laughs) And praise the Lord. Actually, I do want to say one more thing. And it, it's, it's okay, it's good that you're here, Matt. Uh, last week, I wasn't able to be here. And uh, so I chatted with Graham about the service and asked him how it had gone. And it was so interesting to me what Graham said. He pointed to one song in particular that we sang last week and how we really raised the roof together and just how much that had meant to him. I wonder, do we sense God coming to us when we gather together and we sing together? We do, don't we? We feel it. So, so let's be awake and alert to God coming to us as Matt leads us in worship. And Matt's also going to lead us in the benediction. And we can see God in that benediction too. We, we, we might be tempted to see it as just, well, that's kind of a tag on. That's the way we say, it's over. It's time to go. no. It's a prayer. It's a prayer. It's a prayer of blessing. Now, I don't know if you've ever received a prayer of blessing from somebody, but it can be very powerful. And I just want you to think about the benediction this morning and how, what God might be saying to us and how he might be moving among us. Because honestly, when we do a benediction together, we have 100 plus people praying a prayer of blessing for us. Yes, we're praying to God, but we are also praying a prayer of blessing on our brothers and sisters in this sanctuary. And that can be a very powerful thing. So let's see what God wants to say to us 
as we close our service.